Okay, so uh, we're gonna do, in this case, we're doing a modified uh, envelope flap with a vertical releasing incision on the mesial side, as you can see. And the other incisions here now are going in the usual manner, which is from the line angle of the cement to enamel junction of neighboring tooth to the most apical part of the recession on the other tooth. And in this case, we decided to choose the central, uh, the first premolar as the central tooth. So you can see that the incision are going from the canine to the first, pre the first premolar, and then from the first premolar in another direction in the oblique way uh, to the second premolar and, and et cetera, and like that up to the first, uh, first molar. Uh, here now we're doing a split thickness flap. All the incisions are first split thickness. And then we will raise the flap into full thickness until the level of the bone. And it's unlike with the connective tissue graft where the flap is split thickness all the way. When you place a scaffold like this, you want it to sit on the bone. Uh, uh, that, at least that's my experience. So now we're raising a full thickness flap. We're elevating the surgical papillas that we have created. And we're gently elevating uh, the flap, trying to maintain, you know, taking care to maintain the new surgical papillas. So with a small periosteal elevator, we're gently raising, gently raising the flap one by one tooth. Sometimes it doesn't go so easily, but we're doing it bit by bit. We don't cut on the buccal side, so we just cut the tissue in the papillary area. Here we have some obstruction on the vertical releasing incision. So we're gonna gently and carefully with a sharp periosteal elevator, release and cut the attached connective tissue to the underlying bone. And now we can see the outline of the bone. And we just go a little bit more apical to the bone, like that, not too much. There it is, that's sufficient. That's enough. You don't need a lot of it. Not. And we go, it's a little bit more difficult in the molar area, especially when you're filming. So you're looking from, and now we're cutting the periosteum. Okay, so these first gentle incisions are periosteal incisions. So we're detaching the flap from the periosteum. Slowly, gently, I, ra I raise the flap so you can nicely see how it's gently cut. And always use a sharp, sharp new uh, knife. So change the blades as often as you can. And now, we are detaching the muscle fibers from the flap. So we're going perpendicular. Well, we're going parallel to the bone, parallel to the bone, and we're cutting the muscle fibers that are attached to the flap so we can achieve passive closure. And the point, the, the, the intention is that you want your flap to be as passive as possible. So you want your flap to basically by itself Go, go down in a coronal position. So you can see here that we can pull it easily a few millimeters about, uh, away from the cement enamel junction. If you feel that there's a little bit more tension on the flap, continue separating the muscle fibers and continue detaching the flap until it has complete passive uh, uh, laying on over the, over the roots and over the crown of the teeth. As in every 
perio procedure. So we will prepare the root surface, we will scale everything. Now this is my favorite thread for the buckle and palatal sides. It's always the sharpest. Now you have to scale really nicely, but not aggressively, but you have to really make the surface, you know, disease-free. So all of the exposed uh, cementum has been there for a very long time has to be smoothened out. So we remove this. Now many of many like to use the prep gel, the EDPA or the citric acid, but you can use it. Sometimes I use it as well. And look at this root. So what I did before the surgery, I reconstructed the cement enamel junction on, on the first and second molar. So we don't have these cervical root abrasions. Now I will also additionally try to flatten the root surface here a little bit. Uh, the mesiobuccal root. Because it's really a highly protruded in, in the buccal area. I will remove remove this uh, concavity, uh, the convexity. Sorry. So I will just flatten this root a little bit. So not too much. Just a little bit. Okay. We continue to scale the root surface. I'm feeling some. So now, now the root surface looks much better. The mesiobuccal root surface. So now I'm sure it's going to better. With just a little bit more scaling on the chain. Never enough. Okay, now the surface is really smooth. Really, really, really smooth out. The next step is. Uh, Remove the epithelium from the papilla, so we will create the surgical papillas. And uh, I'll go from the from the distal to the mesial and do uh, the so-called peeling. I mean, it can be considered as a peeling. So we now are epithelizing the papillae. Okay, I like to use the number twelve blade. It's uh, very convenient for this. Now this papilla here will, could pose a problem for us because it's very narrow, uh, it's very small, and uh, th this is the area where, where, where you maybe will maybe will have problems with the primary uh, primary closure. Okay, now we continue digitalizing. Okay, let's recheck that we're sure that we got all of the epithelium away, even you know, from the tip of the papilla. As far as I see, all right. And now the flap is fully prepared, and I'll show you what what I mean when when uh, 
okay you see I can move it really significantly in a coronal position okay and now we will start to adapt the volume up. what I've learned over the last three years is that it's much better that you suture the material when it's dry now you will see something very nicely what happens here once you place it on the root surface and once it gets soaked with with blood it adapts really very nicely to the root surface now it's excellent for suturing and we suture it basically in the same fashion or manner as we would suture a connective tissue graft so I'm taking a 6-0 resorbable suture Okay, and we're placing single interrupted sutures, first either mesial or, or, or distal, it doesn't matter. And don't overpress because uh, there's no need. And you, you see how, how, how the material is, is nicely adapted uh, to the root surface. Okay, and then we cut. And now we'll suture the mesial side. Okay, this is good. That's that's the first one. Now, why is it better to? Uh, to do single ones than one big one because you don't have always even uh, areas of the cemento enamel junction so here it's a little bit higher here it's lower then it's lower then it's higher so then the, the in, in this fashion you can individualize and position how you feel fit uh, the scaffold how you feel better in position in the scaffold. So I like to position the scaffold either at the cemento enamel junction or sometimes even a little bit coronal over it to give the adaptation uh, and to support the flap. Because it is a scaffold, it is not a living tissue. So it takes time for this material to turn into the tissue From uh, and that the, that it gets vascularized. So it takes around two weeks for this scaffold to vascularize, which is uh, quite good. And this is, is this is nice. Okay. okay, just sometimes just hold it gently, really gently. So I, I, just remember, uh, don't moist it and then suture it. Suture it dry. It's much better. It's much better. It's much easier. And basically it doesn't tear. Although I have, as I told you initially, a, a success rate uh, on the molar area for me is, is, is not so spectacular. Still these recessions are so, so large in the molar area that, I, that this, this really necessitates uh, that, we, that we place the graft. And I think I'll probably get around 50% of the session coverage. But uh, we will follow this case in, in the long term. So uh, I promise you, you will get all the photos and the follow up. And uh, you know, the initial healing you will show you, and uh, two week healing, and then we will follow it at one month, two months. So we'll follow this case really uh, precisely.
because that that in the end point it's that's that's what you, what you're interested in how the material behaves in the long term okay so what we can see here is that this is this is really nicely stabilized and I, I want to show you something I want to show you something look how stable okay here it's not but look how how stable the material is here it's not here we're gonna stabilize it with additional suture and yeah, we'll see now but look at this look how stable it is and now what I like to do is uh, I like to stabilize the graft I like to stabilize it with cross mattress sutures where we go from the palatal area through the periosteum so we do these cross mattress sutures and I use the 6-0 Pro Lean Suturing material for me this is the best material there is I've been using it for the last 17 years I've never seen a stitch abscess uh, I've never seen an infection, I've never seen inflammation around it, there's almost no plaque accumulation on it, so uh, for me this is the go-to material in all of my periodontal plastic surgery procedures. Okay, and now we go one by one, one by one. You can alternatively choose to do horizontal uh, mattress sutures that uh, I prefer these uh, crisscross. So you're probably interested in how many of these cases I have done over the last two, two and a half, no, it's almost three years. Uh, several hundred. So uh, we treated, uh, I would say, at least a hundred patients with this indication and probably another another hundred with single recession so uh, I find, find this, uh, this approach uh, satisfying for, 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 for a single recession I would say that, that the surgery is finished in 30-35 uh, minutes but since we take photos then it's maybe 40-45 but uh, never longer than that for these uh, so uh, I've gra g gathered considerable experience and uh, I always like to say and I tell everybody in the beginning uh, I thought we could use it as a connective tissue graft you know and suture it in, a, in, in the same way and uh, in the beginning uh, we soaked it and then sutured it and then I realized that it's not going to work because uh, the scaffold would usually, would usually tear. We start suturing the papillus. I prefer to start from the mesial, from the canine. And sometimes I think that for me the 5-0 is a little bit better here. In Now what, what, what I do in these cases, now once I tie the knot here, what I want to do is I go again below the contact point and make a knot on the contact point to maintain this flap in a coronal position. Some like to do sling sutures, that's fine. Uh, what I notice is that I quite often have to additionally add a single suture when I do a sling suture. So sometimes it works perfectly, but sometimes you do have to add, let's say, with a 6 0 suture. So, okay, let's see, uh, here we can do a sling suture. So you go from the buckle. You want your needle to pass through the papilla on the palatal side. You go from the palatal side back to the buckle. You try and you want 
your needle to be a few millimeters away from the tip of the surgical papilla in the middle. You go through the papilla. You want to go through the papilla on the palatal side. You go back here. Now we're going to knock, tie them off here. And we see how we've been able to move the flap in a coronal position. Okay, now we go through that thin, thin papilla. Yeah, yeah, this one. I knew this one was going to be a problem. Uh, I'll do another sling suture here. And uh, I'll try, I want, I'll go in here because I want to adapt the tip of the papilla to the epithelialized part. Tie the knot out here. Okay, I, I want to go an anchor on the contact point here between the second free molar and the molar. Anchor it, keep it in a more coronal position. Now this is this is the last this is the last suture. Oh, hopefully the last one. Never know. Okay, the patient is almost falling asleep. <laughs> <laughs> we can hear him snore a little bit. Maybe he's not, but it certainly sounds like that. Now, this I also want to adapt. So I'm going to place another suture here. And move this tissue, which was in the frication area, coronally as well. So I want to adapt adapt this tissue. So I'm going back here. Here. Oh, there go. That's good. Now this tissue is adapt adapted. And then to dental area. So the thing we're left with is the vertical releasing incision. 
and we will close it with single interrupted sutures. So you want the sutures to be the knots actually to be a little bit from in a coronal position. Okay. So it, you you want the knots to be not to be horizontal but to be in this direction. Okay, so that's that's so it pulls the flap in a coronal position. That's what you want. What? So we'll go one more time here. Oh, something sounds a little. one more suture here. But this suture is going to go a little bit more. So I'm not going to go into the sulcus. I'm going to go just a little bit beyond. And this is it. So the flap is fully closed. We can pull on the flap as much as we want. The tissue is not moving. So uh, we have real, really passive flap here. Really a lot of relaxation in the flap. So there's no movement you can see. So uh, Basically, this is uh, how uh, how I do it on a, on, a, on a weekly basis. I wouldn't say on a daily basis, but on a weekly basis, especially over the last year and a half. Once I got used to to the to the material, and once I learned uh, its limitations, so that's it. Uh, um, I I I tried it in the lower anterior front. Uh, it's very difficult to achieve a 100% root closure. Uh, the best outcome is from canine, to, uh, from premolar to premolar in the upper jaw, no doubt about it. 
Then the second best outcome are, let's say, the lower premolars or a lower canine, but that is not positioned in a, in a different direction. Uh, molars are so-so. Sometimes it works really nice. Sometimes it's not. It's like you know, uh, hot and cold uh, outcome. Again, uh, thank you very much. And this is the end. Bye.